فعاش القلب وإخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روبا الخير إن شاء الله we'll be reading from verse number one of سورة المنافقون page number 570 of صحيح international translation أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا جاءك المنافقون قالوا نشهد إنك لرسول الله والله يعلم إنك لرسوله والله يشهد إن المنافقين لكاذبون اتخذوا أيمانهم جنة فصدوا عن سبيل الله إنهم ساء ما كانوا يعملون ذلك بأنهم آمنوا ثم كفروا فطبع على قلوبهم فهم لا يفقهون وإذا رأيتهم تعجبك أجسامهم وإن يقولوا تسمع لقولهم كأنهم خشب مسندة يحسبون كل صيحة عليهم هم العدو فاحذرهم قاتلهم الله أنا يؤفكون وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا يَسْتَوْفِرْ لَكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَوَّوْا رُؤُوسَهُمْ وَرَأَيْتَهُمْ وَرَأَيْتَهُمْ يَصُدُّونَ وَهُمْ مُسْتَكْبِرُونَ سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَسْتَوْفَرْتَ لَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تَسْتَوْفِرْ لَهُمْ لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ هُمُ الَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ لَا تُنْفِقُوا عَلَى مَنْ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ حَتَّى يَنْفَضُّوا وَلِلَّهِ خَزَائِنُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ يقولون لئن رجعنا إلى المدينة ليخرجن الأعز منها الأذل ولله العزة ولرسوله وللمؤمنين ولكن المنافقين لا يعلمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله ومن يفعل ذلك فأولئك هم الخاسرون وأنفقوا مما رزقناكم من قبل أن يأتي أحدكم الموت فيقول رب لولا فيقول رب لولا أخرتني إلى أجل قريب فأصدق وأكن من الصالحين ولن يؤخر الله نفسا إذا جاء أجلها والله خبير بما تعملون بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His entire household without exception All his companions without exception We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us And to grant us goodness And to grant us entry into paradise Ameen my mothers and sisters, this is a surah named after the hypocrites. So these hypocrites were actually those who were divided into a few categories. The first type of hypocrites, the worst, 
those are the ones who pretend to be Muslim, but they are not. They enter the fold of Islam in order to fulfill an agenda. So they would like to forward their agenda with the enemies of Islam. They pretend to be Muslims. They come in, they say the Shahada, but they are not Muslims. They infiltrate the ranks of the Muslimin. They come for Salah. They create division. They create problems. They create issues. And they were never Muslimin in their hearts. They always used to utter good words, but inside they belonged to someone else. They belonged to something else. They actually affiliated or belonged to a totally different faith. From among these, there were those who were named by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, he was given the names from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for you and I to say that this person is a hypocrite in this sense, it would be wrong. For us, we don't know. Anyone who utters the shahada, who says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu, I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger of Allah, sallallahu uh, alayhi wa sallam, then definitely it would be for us a Muslim. The person would be known as a Muslim and they would be submitters because outwardly they have surrendered to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, we would love to see them fulfilling their obligations unto Allah and abstaining from prohibitions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made clear. So that's the first type of hypocrite, those who enter the fold of Islam without being Muslim. They are doing that for an agenda. For those, they have been warned of something extremely dangerous. Allah says, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ وَلَن تَجِدَ لَهُمْ نَصِيرًا Indeed, such hypocrites are or will be in the lowest level of the fire and they will never have anyone to help them. Lowest level of the fire meaning the hottest. You know when you have a flame, the hottest part of that flame is where all the coal is and where all the stones are or whatever may be at the bottom of that particular fire, you would find all the fuel. So Allah says they will be part of that fuel. They will be in the lowest part of the fire and nobody will be able to help them because that would be the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's just a warning for everyone to say, don't be hypocrites to this degree where Obviously, we should not be hypocrites at all, but this is the worst degree possible. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about them. I said earlier that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the names of people who were hypocrites when it came to belief. They were not Muslim, but they pretended to be Muslim. From among them was Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. He pretended to be a companion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a Jewish man before he had entered the faith or in fact he was one of the men from uh, he was one of the men from the people of Medina. Uh, the Jewish man was a, a different person later on known as Abdullah ibn Saba. He was the founder of the Shia sect of the Muslimin. He came into the fold of Islam and he pretended to be a Muslim and he started creating hatred against the companions. And for this reason, you find the Shia do not believe in the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam at all besides six of them. Yesterday, I actually saw a clip of how people were entering Shiism. They have to swear Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, radiallahu anhum, and Aisha and Hafsa, radiallahu anhuma, and they have to declare that I bear witness that those are in the fire. That's how you become a Shia. So this, these clips are available online. Let's not fool ourselves. That they are, their faith is based on cursing all the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. For this reason, you will notice when I started this lecture and of late, I have been saying, may Allah's blessings be upon the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa without exception. And may Allah's blessings be upon the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without exception. The minute you say without exception, it is confirmation who you are and your identity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us without exception as well. Amen. So my mothers and sisters, uh, the, these hypocrites were those who entered the fold of Islam in order to divide the Muslims, to split them, to destroy the Muslim unity and to destroy the belief that Islam had come with. And if you notice, uh, the names that were given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were quite a few. He only told one companion those names and this person's, uh, this companion's name was Hudayfah ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu. And Abu Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu is gone on record as having asked Hudayfah ibn al-Yaman for the list. 
And Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu refused. So on that, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu said, well, I just want to know if my name is on the list. Which means I just want you to confirm that I'm not from among the hypocrites. They were worried because obviously they tried their best to adopt the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it would be good to know that your name is not from among the baddies, those who are evil, those who are ill. So uh, Allah then subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this entire surah exposing some of the qualities of the hypocrites. The second type of hypocrites are those who are Muslimin, but they say one thing and they do something else. And in this, a lot of the people are actually included. This type of hypocrisy is not nifaq in, in belief, but it is rather nifaq, nifaq meaning hypocrisy in deeds. So you say you're a Muslim, but then you don't dress properly. You say you adopt the instruction of Allah, but then you keep on disobeying Allah's instruction. And you keep on doing it. One is to do it out of sin, and the other is to do it out of defiance, and to keep on doing it without even thinking about changing. Recently, people say, oh, you know, my son was radicalized. The first signs was that uh, they began to, uh, for example, uh, fulfill their salah uh, in the masjid. Uh, or my daughter was radicalized. One of the first signs was she began to wear a scarf. Well, if that's the case, my beloved mothers and sisters, my fathers, the parents who are out there, then you need to know that there was your duty from the beginning to have filled the void that was in the heart or in the life of that child of yours for spirituality by, by bringing them towards wearing the scarf or going to the masjid yourself without allowing others to involve in such a way that they would then become further away from the family. So when the family is drinking, they clubbing and so on and calling themselves Muslims, cosmetic Muslims, in that particular case, when a child finds something wrong with the pornography that the dad is watching and the drinking and the drugs that the dad or the mom are participating in, the, you know, uh, within their own lives, calling themselves Muslimin, the, the, the frustration of the child may lead the child towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To that level or to that point, there was nothing wrong. So to have put on the scarf and quit pornography and quit evil, that was a duty of all the parents to instill in their children because because the parents failed in their duty, children went to search for it elsewhere. That is where the problem was. So when you don't teach your children correct Islam, remember there is a void in them. They will definitely search for their maker. They will search for happiness. They watch you. They see how, lack, how much lack of contentment there is in your life. They see how sad you are. They see the sins you're engaged in. They don't want to lead that life. They're searching for something better. It is there. It is provided from Allah. If you are not going to guide them, if you're not going to help them to put on the scarf, for example, to be able to live as a Muslim, to fulfill their salah, to be able to abstain from prohibition, then they will search for it elsewhere. That is the moment you have failed. That is the moment you have failed because then you have predators sitting outside. Obviously, when people come for guidance, you will have the vast majority of Muslim scholars who preach peace and tolerance and goodness. Alhamdulillah, if they fall into those hands, good news. But there are people online who are sitting and waiting to radicalize our children in a bad way, in the sense that they will sit and start off with that which is common, that which is supposed to be. And then they teach them or they take them onto a level where they begin to teach them something totally wrong and unacceptable. And they take them away from you and they become radicalized in a very bad sense. They, they become violent extremists who are people who the whole world is worried about today, including ourselves. So let's understand, it's not wrong for your child to become devoted. There's a very big difference. The child is devoted, but if they were devoted by external forces and not within the home, then there is a possibility of that having been at the hands of those who are going to abuse them in that particular sense. It's quite clear what I'm saying, and I hope we understand. Most of us, mashallah, we dress appropriately, we try to fulfill our salah, we stay away from haram, we eat only halal food, we are so concerned and bothered about our income and our halal, and so on, we try to fulfill our salah as best as possible. So many things, the dress code, we quit, for example, uh, listening to the beat and the music of today and so on. So all this does not mean we are radical, but it means we are devoted. And Alhamdulillah, I know of non-Muslims who are devoted in a similar way. 
When I say that, I mean I know of non-Muslims who are not into pornography, not into drinking. They also try and pray in their own prayers as best as possible. They are devoted. They would never commit the, the sins within their faith. That means they are devoted in their own faith. So devotion is not the problem. What the problem is, is when a person actually becomes devoted at the hands of people who are going to then convert that into something radical, unacceptable, making them hate others in a way that they want to harm them. And this is where the problem lies. So I believe it's the failure of the parents. They need to understand for us to try and lead a life of, uh, you know, Satan, for example, a life full of clubbing, a life full of drugs, a life full of gambling, a life full of sin, a life full of adultery, and a life full of pornography. In that particular case, the children will be fighting within themselves to get out of that, and we would have never been their guiding light. So don't blame the child for having found Allah, but you blame yourself for the child thereafter, having been abused by people who made the child feel that this is what Allah taught, yet Allah did not teach it. Okay, that was quite clear. And the reason I make mention of this is because we are speaking of hypocrites. We as Muslimin are sometimes guilty of not following what we say we are. Similarly, we don't even want to learn about it. It's, it's very, very hypocritical to say I'm a Muslim and you don't have a clue what Islam teaches. You don't have a clue about the Quran. You don't even know how to respond to people who start claiming that the Quran has violent verses in it. Yet the Bible has a thousand times more violent and dangerous verses in it. And if you were to Google it, you would actually find it. But the reality is when you don't have knowledge, you begin to think that these verses have a meaning outside the context in which they were actually revealed, whether it is the Bible or the Quran or whatever else. In our case, obviously, it's important for us to know the Quran, to understand the context in which the verses were revealed, to understand how these verses are applicable in my life. When, for example, uh, everything fits into place, then we will be able to understand uh, better and we will be able to fulfill in a better way. So my mothers and sisters, extremely important for us to note that it's our duty to live as best as we can according to what we claim we are. And wherever we falter, we commit sin, we should actually then turn to Allah in repentance. And Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. So Allah revealed this entire surah in order to expose the liars, in order to expose the hypocrites. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commences it by telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how to react when the hypocrites come to you promising and swearing using oaths. You know, they will say, Wallahi, I promise in the name of Allah, I take an oath. For example, in this name and that name, and I promise you, yet they are lying. So Allah says, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ When the hypocrites will come to you, do you know what they will say? قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ We testify that you are the messenger of Allah. And Allah is saying, Allah knows that you are his messenger, and Allah testifies that the hypocrites are liars. So this verse is actually confirming that there are people who say, I testify you are the messenger, and in their hearts they do not testify. They are actually lying. They, there is no testification there. So Allah says, Wallahu yashhadu inna al-munafiqeena lakathibun. Allah bears witness, Allah testifies that the hypocrites are indeed liars. Then Allah says, they have made their oaths a screen for their hypocrisy. Thus they hinder men from the path of Allah. Verily, evil is what they used to do. One of the signs of a hypocrite is that they do evil. They preach evil. They teach evil. They promote evil. A true mu'min, a true believer would actually promote peace and goodness, would promote that which would result in the calmness and contentment of an individual. That's a true believer. But a fake person who is a hypocrite, they preach evil, they preach hatred, intolerance, they preach harm to others. You know, the true believers, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from among them. Their concern is how best can I promote this faith in a way that the maximum number of people see the goodness in it. That's what it is. That's a true believer. But those who are evil, those who promote evil and harm, those are the ones whom you need to be careful of. We, need to, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. If we take a look at the noble Quran, or should I say the Sahih International Translation, it says, they have taken their oaths as a cover. So they avert people from the way of Allah. Indeed, it was evil that they were doing. What they were doing was very evil, and they are evil doers. So Allah calls it an oath. All they said is, I bear witness. That's what they said. 
Nashhadu. We bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger. And Allah says the term I bear witness is equivalent to an oath being taken. So Allah says that oath of theirs is just being used as a cover. Be careful. Be careful of people's statements. Sometimes they would just be lying. So they need to prove those statements by the actions that they would then be uh, showing or they would be engaged in. Verse number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا ثُمَّ كَفَرُوا فَطُبِعَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ فَهُمْ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ That is because they believed and then they disbelieved. So their hearts were sealed over and they do not understand. So this is mentioning a different category of hypocrites. Those who believed initially and then they disbelieved. They are also hypocrites. Within their hearts, they have a shaking. They don't believe. They no longer believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, you know what? Be careful. These people are hypocrites. They do not understand. لا يفقهون. لا يع... the, the, the verses لا يعلمون or لا يفقهون. They don't know or they don't understand. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who understand. You need to make an effort to understand. You need to go out to learn. You need to make sure. People say my iman is weak, which means, you know, I'm shaky. You're shaky because you haven't made an effort to learn. That's what it is. If you learned and you understood and you compared and you knew and you knew how to answer people in that particular case, you would not be shaking. There is no way you can actually shake when your iman is firm, when your belief is firm. And the sign of a true believer is the calmness, the contentment that that person achieves in their heart. That's a sign of conviction and firm belief. And it's a sign of being on the straight path. It's a path full of goodness, full of peace and stability, calmness, serenity. These are the words. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us peace. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you see them, their forms please you. Which means, wow, look at them. They look so good looking. They are, they are big in size, muscular people, mashallah. At that time, the head of the hypocrites was quite a muscular person, big in size, big in size. And if, if the, he was looked at, people would say, wow, look at this guy. So Allah says, do not be deceived by looks. Basically, that's what we're learning. Don't be deceived by the outward appearance of a person. A person who might appear to be a scrawny, thin person who perhaps no one wants to look at might be so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody would have known. Don't maltreat people based on their looks, based on their color, their race and so on. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in this regard. This verse is a wake up call to say sometimes those who look so pious are actually not. Don't be deceived by the outward looks. That does not mean that do not concentrate on your own outward looks. Remember, it doesn't mean do not concentrate on your own outward looks. You need to make sure that you are also dressed appropriately to please Allah. But don't be fooled by others who may be dressed in a way that seems pious, but they are involved in all sorts of mischief. They are hypocrites. They would like to harm us. People who come to you with a broad smile, be careful. That smile could just be a plastic one. It could just be one that is there in order to deceive you. What's the point of someone who smiles so broad and as you leave, they are stabbing you in your back. I'd rather have a person who frowns, who's upset and lets me know that I'm angry. I'm upset with you because of X, Y and Z. At least I know how to tackle it. At least I know how to answer, how to deal with it. Subhanallah. That person is far better because they're not hypocrites. A person who says, listen, this guy, I'm sorry, I don't like you. I don't like you. Why? Because I think you did this and you did that and that was very bad. It gives you the opportunity to clarify and to clear. But a person who, Salaamu Alaikum, you know, with the broadest smile from ear to ear, such that you even develop chaps and cracks on your lips. And as soon as you leave, you know, this person here, they're stealing money. From where? From wherever. Or they're doing this. Why couldn't you have told them straight on their face? Don't be a hypocrite. Allah has kept an entire surah named after hypocrites in order to combat people like this. So don't do that. And as much as we talk about others, my mothers and sisters, what's important is for me to ask myself, do I have these qualities? You meet someone, oh, mashallah, sister, how are you? You know, we, mashallah, good to see you. And in your heart, you go, ah, you know, there's a mooing sound of a cow. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. 
May Allah forgive us. Don't ever let that happen. Cleanse the heart, my mothers and sisters. Too many of the ummah's problems are connected to hypocrites. So Allah says, when you see them, their forms please you. Obviously, I diverted in order to try and currentize it for us to learn lessons from this. And if they speak, you listen to their speech. Wow, they're eloquent as well sometimes. MashaAllah, they can tell you things and they can con you through what they're saying, you know. Especially the salesmen who know that the product they have is fake, for example. And they tell you, genuine, genuine, I'm telling you. This thing is legit. As soon as you buy it, they disappear and the product is broken. What happens to the guarantee? You dial the number. This number does not exist. Have you heard that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. I'm just giving you an example. Throwing an example or two in order for us to relate to this. When, you, when they speak, you listen to them. You're convinced by their speech. There's so many hypocrites. Recently I heard a, a, a guy claiming to have converted from Islam to Christianity, an Indian guy, claiming that the, the, the Quran led him to Jesus because the word of Allah uh, and the spirit of Allah uh, is referring to Jesus. So Jesus is higher than Muhammad and so on and so forth. He spoke absolute nonsense, complete nonsense. He didn't even know the Arabic language to, to translate what the meaning of Ruhullahi is. And the meaning of kalimatullahi. He doesn't even know. The word of Allah simply means be. 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 Kun. When Allah wants to create something, He says be. And it is. That's the meaning of the word of Allah. It's not a Christian meaning. The Christians have a different meaning. The word of Allah to them, the word of God, is something totally different. The Muslimin believe the word of God is actually a word uttered. It's a word. Be. And it is. That's what the word is. It doesn't make you so, something you know, so different and something else. It's the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Adam was one of the first of humankind. He was also created by the same word. Be, and he was. Jesus, be, and he was. So that's Allah's decision. He does as he wishes. And the term ruhullahi is referring to the soul from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Souls are from Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to elevate the status of something, he connects it to himself like baytullah, the house of Allah. The house of Allah. So this is the soul of Allah, which means Allah has sent it. Ardullahi means the earth of Allah. These are common Arabic terms. So this is why I said a person doesn't know the Arabic language, trying to con the whole world and presenting the interview in such a way that those who are weak and don't know much about their own faith in terms of Islam would probably begin to ask questions. Well, it's good to ask questions, but get the answers from the right people. It's so foolish. I mean, if that was correct, the whole of the Muslim world would have converted a long, long time back. Why is it that more and more people are accepting Islam, even though it's not easy to do so today? Because the whole world is standing up against what people have hijacked in terms of faith and religion and used the name of Islam in order to promote that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. May Allah keep us steadfast. There is definitely, definitely the plan of shaitan to take our faith away from us and our children. And it's happening in such a way that we become so apologetic that we give up our Islamic teachings. We don't want to be seen as Muslimin. Our names shouldn't sound Muslim. Our dress code shouldn't look Muslim. We shouldn't be seen going to the masjid. Well, if that's the case, I tell you, the next generation will not even have known what we were. They won't because we were too shy to live up to it. So what? If the whole world thinks you're bad, but you have proven that you will dress appropriately, you will make sure you live as a Muslim, and you're still one of the best possible people going out, reaching out not only to other human beings of different faiths and inclinations, but even animals and the other plants as per the instruction upon you as a Muslim. That's when they will realize the beauty of Islam. Two billion people on earth, perhaps. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from hypocrisy. So going back to the point, be careful of the outward appearance of people. Don't let it fool you. That doesn't mean you shouldn't concentrate on it. Some people think, you know what? I don't need to dress appropriately. I don't need to be seen in the masjid. I don't need to look like a Muslim. I don't need to have a name like a Muslim, for example, because Allah knows my heart. Allah knows your heart. And Allah will keep on knowing your heart until you die, isn't it? Astaghfirullah. Don't use that as an excuse to convince yourself that it's okay to sin. No. 
Yes, you might tell people, please don't judge me. That's okay. But don't judge me, meaning that, you know what? Don't think I'm an evil person. No, I'm not. I'm busy struggling to, uh, to, to obey the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My struggles I know about. Yes, we appreciate that type of comment. Or we appreciate those in that situation. But a person who keeps on drinking, you know, and you can actually hear the, 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 the alcohol go down the throat, you know, good, 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 good. I'm sure you might be hearing people who don't know how to drink, for example, or want to drink too much. And they kept on doing, don't judge me. Stop judging. Stop judging your sound. The way you're talking is judging yourself. Subhanallah. You don't even know. You're probably seeing three of your own self in the mirror. Allahu Akbar. Which one are you talking about? So it's foolish to say, don't judge me, to run away from advice and just to keep on sinning. But if a person is struggling and they're trying to come out of something they've been in and so on, yes, we encourage them to keep on trying and we ask Allah to have mercy on them and on every one of us. So in this particular surah, Allah speaks about all of these categories. And Allah says, look, there will be people outwardly, they will look so good and their speech will be so sweet. But you don't know, you don't know whether they are beneficial or harmful. So just be careful. Just be careful. Now don't go around looking at everyone who looks pious and say, this person must be a hypocrite. That person must be a hypocrite. That person must... Don't do that. That's not what is meant. Allah is just telling you, look, be careful, be alert. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. There is a hadith which speaks about a person who is the biggest loser. And Allah says uh, through the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because it's a hadith, that the biggest loser, the most bankrupt person will be the one who was very pious on earth. They used to read salah, they used to give zakah, they used to have so many good deeds, but they used to backbite, they used to deceive, they used to slander, they harmed, they ate the wealth of this person, and they did this to that person. So on the day of judgment, all their good deeds will go to everybody else and they will be cast in hellfire because they will then be made to shoulder the burden of others whom they owe goodness to because of what bad they have done to them. That's a loser. So in the world they appear to be so pious. Subhanallah. So holy that some of their good deeds slipped through all those holes. Astaghfirullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that type of behavior. And then Allah mentions another quality of the hypocrites. Verse number four, Allah says, when you see them, their forms please you. And if they speak, you listen to their speech. They are as if they were pieces of wood propped up. Pieces of wood propped up here, referring to bodies empty, bodies with empty minds and empty hearts. You know, it's like a piece of wood, bamboo, outwardly, wow. And inside, hollow, completely nothing, nothing, hollow. So be careful of people who appear like tree trunks, nothing inside. Then Allah says, they think that every shout is against them. You know this, يَحْسَبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةٍ عَلَيْهِمْ Listen to it and memorize it. يَحْسَبُونَ كُلَّ صَيْحَةٍ عَلَيْهِمْ They think that every shout is against them. When anyone says anything, they feel that this is being projected at me. Now, my mothers and sisters, a lot of us are guilty of this. Someone says something and we think, oh, they did it because of me. This is what they did because of me. That's a sign of hypocrisy. Don't do that. Don't allow yourself to keep on thinking about others. It's going to depress you. They did not do it because of you. Someone said something and said, you know, mothers and sisters, it's important for us to cleanse our hearts. Oh, they're talking to about me. It's okay if you're feeling that, okay, the speech is related to me in the sense that I must uh, improve. This person perhaps doesn't know you. A lot of the times when I speak, for example, people come to me and say, well, do you know of the problem we have? And I don't know. I've got no time to know. I don't have gigabyte capacity in my hard drive for, for me to be able to put that type of silly information in my head and, and, you know, slow down my entire processing speed of my own computer. I'm talking my head here. I don't have the time and space. I'm not a little gossiper who's worried about everybody else's life. I'm worried about real life issues in my own life. And I'm worried about positively convincing people to become better and myself to begin with. So don't think that this man knows and this guy knows this and that. And I don't know anything. And I don't want to know. Trust me, I don't want to know. The less you know about people's problems, the better. And if you want to know them only to be a positive contribution towards the solution, then that's the only time you deserve to know. 
But if you want to know what happened, you know, you know WhatsApp, actually it's supposed to be WhatsApp, you know. It's just an application, so they call it WhatsApp, right? Do you know that that's all about WhatsApp? You want to know what's happening, that's all. Tell me, what, what's happening? You know, I saw this, you know, my neighbor did this, you know, this is what happened to this person, you know, my mother-in-law. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, your WhatsApp will jam when you start those stories. But to be honest with you, the reality is, all of that could be backbiting, deceiving, gossiping, so on, so forth, saying things. You did not solve the problem. That's what it is. You did not resolve the matter. You didn't. May Allah forgive us. In fact, you earned sin because you're talking about people behind their backs. As much as it's become easy to earn reward, it's become easy to earn sin as well. So my mothers and sisters, let's be careful what we say. And let's be careful how we perceive what others say. When people say, you know, we need to fulfill salah. Look, 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 she's poking me, you know. You know, we need to dress appropriately. Oh, he must have just seen me come out of my car just now. He must. Nobody saw anything. That is just a hypocritical feeling within you sometimes. Yes, there is a fine line between the two feelings. One is you begin to hate the person because you think they're attacking you. That's what we're talking about. But two is when you take and you take in the message because you know this message, yes, it's directed at me. That's from Allah. If, for example, I've said something that's impacted in your life or you've said something that's impacted in my life, that's from Allah. I happily took it. I embraced it and I changed my life. That's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I took it to be personal, to be myself. Yes, because I wanted to improve. That is a sign of a believer. But when you take it personally in the wrong sense, whereby you begin to hate the person and think they're attacking you, that's what is being spoken about. That's hypocrisy. A person is walking calmly and casually down your street. This person's a thief. They want to steal from our house. It happens. They're not a thief. You might want to close your gate because you want to protect yourself. But stop pointing at someone who's innocently walking down the road. That's happening to Muslimin across the globe. People walking, strolling down the streets and everyone says, hey, you know what? This person's a terrorist. Astaghfirullah. And you may be doing it in your own small way, in the sense that you're blaming others for things they are not. Don't do that. Don't just think everything is against you. And in this particular instance, obviously at that time, whenever verses were revealed, whenever people used to say something, the hypocrites used to say, wow, they're attacking us. Look, they're talking about us. They're talking about us. They're not talking about you. They don't have the time to talk about you. They don't know you. They don't want to know you. Subhanallah, each one has his own problems. So if you have the time to talk negative about someone else, trust me, it's going to snatch your contentment away. Remember what I've just said. If you have the time to talk negatively about others, it's going to snatch your contentment away, your own contentment. It's going to go. Oh, this woman, did you see? She bought the latest car. I'm sure she must have stolen the money. I'm sure her husband's probably dealing in drugs. I'm sure they probably did this and did that. What are you talking about? Why are you saying things like those? For what? Why do you want to engage negatively? Be such a hypocrite. And when we see them, wow, nice car. Can I have a ride? Astaghfirullah. What ride are you talking about? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. They didn't steal your money. So carry on. Just lead your life. However they got it, Allah blessed them. Perhaps the gold coins dropped from the ceiling in their case. Alhamdulillah. So what? The point is, let's not engage negatively in people's lives. And let's not think that whatever people are saying is against us in a bad way. No. And let's not think they're referring to us in a negative way. Like I said, you take it personally in a good way, not in a bad way. So this is why It's used even as a statement or a phrase that is said commonly where people feel offended very fast. And they think that, you know what, this person's attacking me. People say, It's a sign of hypocrisy when everybody, when they, when they begin to think that whatever everybody is saying is just against us. Nobody's against you. Nobody actually is against you. Nobody. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are the enemy. So beware of them. May Allah destroy them. How are they deluded? Look at how they have been fabricating. That's what Allah is saying. They are the enemy. Beware of them. Imagine Allah is saying, may Allah destroy them. Allah is saying, may Allah destroy them. 
The reason is, and some people say, look, Allah is Ghafoor Rahim, Allah is so forgiving. Uh, why is He saying He wants to destroy this type of people? Because the reason is they are the worst of the lot. They are hypocrites, they're pretending to be someone whom they are not, and they're actually causing so much of harm, they'd rather come out in the open and say, this is where I belong, this is what it is. These people are hiding behind barriers in order to destroy, in order to deceive. So Allah says, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy them. How, they are how are they denying or deviating from the right path? Look at it. That's what Allah is saying. Look at how they're denying or deviating from the right path. And when it is said to them, come to the messenger of Allah. When it is said to them, come, the messenger of Allah will ask forgiveness for you. They turn their heads aside and you see them evading while they are arrogant. Yes, when they were told that come, come to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he will seek forgiveness for you and perhaps Allah will forgive you. They turned their head and they ran away in an arrogant way. They evaded. Now, my mothers and sisters, how do I learn a lesson from this? When the message of the same messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes to us through people and we then turn our heads away and say, ah, it's okay, I'm gone. Haven't we just fallen into a similar category? We haven't even turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We haven't even become better people. We haven't cleansed our hearts. We haven't resolved our matters. We haven't tried to resolve our matters. Yes, we fall into a similar category whereby we are being instructed by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to do something and we just turn away. So don't turn away. Like I said moments ago, don't use the word don't judge me in order to run away from becoming a better person, from improving yourself, from quitting sin and bad habits. So Allah says, it is all the same for them. Whether you ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them, never will Allah forgive them because they themselves have not asked forgiveness. Do you see the difference? When you ask forgiveness for someone else who doesn't want you to ask for that forgiveness, what's the point? Allah says, I'm not going to forgive them because they don't want the forgiveness. I've given the example in the past of a child who is unruly at school and the headmaster calls the parents and the child continues to be unruly and the parents continue to apologize. Those apologies are not accepted because it's not the child who's apologizing, it's the parents and the child is continuing to do whatever evil the child keeps, keeps on doing. Maybe not evil because it's just a child, but perhaps bad, something wrong. But the day the child says, listen, I'm sorry, I'm wrong, I won't do it again. Then even if the parents didn't ask for that forgiveness, it should have been enough with the headmaster. Totally different example when it comes to Allah, but we just draw a similarity on some lines. You ask Allah's forgiveness for someone else who doesn't really want that forgiveness. Allah says, stop it, man. They don't want it. And this is the reason why if parents or if people have passed on and they have chosen disbelief over Iman, don't ask Allah for their forgiveness and for, their, for, ha for having mercy on them. Because Allah says, don't do that. They didn't want it. So you're just wasting your time. People say, but why can't I ask forgiveness for this person? They knew about Islam, Iman, Allah. They didn't want it. They chose another path. Leave them. Let it be between them and Allah. They can sort it out. You don't involve. They did not want it at all. You cannot shove a Mercedes Benz down the throat of someone who loves Toyota. You can't. Maybe in Zimbabwe you can, to be honest with you. But then they won't have the money to service the vehicle. Every time you service a Mercedes, you need enough to buy one little Corolla. Did you know that? So my mothers and sisters, it's common logic. Allah tells you don't. Allah told Muhammad wasallam not to. Even regarding his own uncle. Allah says, even Ibrahim alayhi salam, we told him don't. Your father chose a path. He knew what he was doing. He chose it. He didn't want your path. For, for all I care, he probably was praying that you went on to his path. Astaghfirullah. So this is why Allah says, seek forgiveness for them or don't seek forgiveness for them. You know what? Never will Allah forgive them. Indeed, Allah does not guide those 
defiantly disobedient people. Did you hear that? Allah does not guide those who are defiantly disobedient. When you say, look, I'm involved in this, for example, uh, immorality, and it is wrong, and I, I know it's a weakness, and I ask Allah's forgiveness, and I'm trying my best to come out of it. You know what? There is still hope for you. There is mercy. But if you say, you know what? I'm engaged in this immorality, and there's nothing that says it's wrong, and I'm going to carry on doing it. It's not immoral. It's actually now moral. Then you are called a person who's defiantly disobedient. And Allah says he does not guide those who are defiantly disobedient. And there's no even point seeking Allah's forgiveness for them. They are the ones who say, do not spend on those who are with the messenger of Allah until they disband. And yet Allah says to Allah belongs the depositories of the heavens and the earth. But the hypocrites do not understand. They are saying, don't spend in the path of Allah. You see, one of the signs of the hypocrites, they are stingy and they encourage others to be stingy like them. They don't want to spend. So they don't want to spend anything. They don't want to spend for the cause of Allah, for something that will please Allah, so for, to reach out to the poor, the needy, the cause of Allah, to build or for example, to, to spend on anything that will please Allah. They don't want. They say, no, 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 don't spend. And Allah says, you know what? You don't realize all that wealth actually belongs to Allah. The depositories from the beginning belong to Allah in the heavens and on earth. Everything belongs to Allah. This is just a test, so you'd better spend. A sign of a hypocrite doesn't spend in the cause of Allah. A sign of a good believer spends and knows that I need to spend because if I die, all this is going to be a waste. A waste. What's the point of accumulating billions and you haven't even spent it and you die? And guess what happens? Normally, the more you leave, the greater the chances of hatred, enmity, and even the, the intent of harming one another within your own children because of the amounts that you've left behind. It has happened in a lot of homes. People don't speak to each other. Why? Because father left a little bit too much. And those whom father left nothing, perhaps they're good buddies, mashallah, good friends. It's just a lesson. It's not a rule. There is the opposite, obviously, on all sides. And there are things that have happened the other way. But this is just by way of example. So my mothers and sisters, take a look at this. The hypocrites are those who don't spend and they discourage people from spending. Then do you know what they say? If we return to al Madinah, the more honored in power will surely expel therefrom the more humble, which means the lower in their eyes. And Allah says to Allah belongs the honor and to his messenger and to the believers, but the hypocrites do not know. Honor is ultimately belonging to Allah, to the messenger, to the believers. Ultimate honor. In the interim, you might see something. You might see this and that. But ultimately, those are the ones, the owners of honor. Now, this was at the time of the battle where the hypocrites said, that you know what, these Muslimin are gone out, they're never going to come back. They're never going to come back. So we will definitely kick the remainder of them out when they come back. We got a big alliance and we will definitely be from among the winners. We will be from among those who are victorious. And Allah says they don't even know. Verse number 9, Allah says, O oh, you who have believed. In fact, no, that's not verse number 9. Verse number 9 says, O oh, you who have believed, let not your wealth and your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah. Never let your wealth or your children distance you from Allah. What a clear verse. O oh, you who have believed, never let your wealth or your children, your family members, divert you from Allah, from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does that is indeed a loser. They are from the losers. So this verse shows that you can become a hypocrite when you allow your family members, your wealth and anything else, your position, your clout, your authority, your looks, whatever else to divert you from Allah, then you become a loser. Don't. No matter what you have, become close to Allah. Your children might, for example, sometimes divert you or certain things may or responsibilities might make you forget about Allah. Don't let that happen. No way. People say, no, 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 I'm just changing the nappy. Change the nappy, just hang on. Salah will take you five minutes, not more than that. Don't worry. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. May Allah open our doors. I've given you one small example. It's probably not even applicable in the lives of most. But I don't want to get too technical. It's quite clear when we say your children, don't let them divert you from the remembrance of Allah, from getting close to Allah. Your wealth as well. Okay, let's proceed to the next verse. Allah says, And spend in the way of Allah, 
from that we have provided you before death approaches one of you. And then he says, my Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so that I would give charity and be from among the righteous. So Allah says, use your life in such a way that you don't regret it the day death overtakes you. That's what Allah is saying. Imagine this verse is actually telling you, spend what we've given you before death overtakes you. And then when you die and you see the reward of having spent and you see the sin of having been stingy. And then you say, oh Allah, send me back quickly. Let me spend whatever I had and be righteous. And then I'll quickly come back. Allah says, too late, too late. You can't do that. So this is why Allah says, spend from now. Don't ever complain. Someone asks you, how is the situation? What's happening? You say, Alhamdulillah. It's not as it used to be before, but Alhamdulillah. We are going through tough times, but Alhamdulillah. We only eat one meal a day, but Alhamdulillah. Wow. Thank Allah upon all conditions. And the last verse of the surah, and I know I've taken a little bit more of your time. But the last verse of the surah, Allah says, Never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come. And Allah is aware of what you do. When your time comes, you are going. That's what it is. Allah tells us clearly, When your fixed time comes, Allah will never delay a soul. When your death approaches, there you are. You're going to leave. So just leave with a smile. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Prepare for the day. Be conscious of the fact that it could be any moment. You know what? You and I could die right here, right now. We could, if Allah wills. You may never see your house again. You may never go and see your loved ones again. You, there may be people you'll never meet again here in this world. If Allah wants, that can happen. If Allah wants to take you away in any way, a small little clot can actually just finish you up and you don't even know. But the winners are those who prepare for the day. They die with a smile because they know they're getting to a better place. They've spent their years in this world in the best possible way. They've sought Allah's forgiveness as best as they could, as much as they can. One of the best ways of earning paradise is to constantly ask Allah's forgiveness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us.